There's a person here who actually is, is about to speak next who, who is the reason we're here today. Um, because, and he, he doesn't quite under, maybe fully realise, but I was, had the pleasure of visiting the Army, um, uh, the Barracks um, Museum recently, and there's a beautiful pocket museum in uh, James Stevens Barracks. And as I was being shown around it, the photograph which is just behind me here was, I was looking at it, and uh, Lieutenant Larry Scallon po pointed out to me that this was a photograph of the troops, of the volunteers at the handover. And I said, and when was that? And he said, oh, that's on the 7th, or they did it on the 7th and 8th of February, that the 8th was the first full day. So this man is, as I say, has been key to um, tonight, and is a wonderful, um, uh, has a wonderful interest in, his, and, uh, in the history of this time. Um, he's going to give us a brief outline of, I suppose, the reality of military life in Kilkenny at the, over that period. So show your appreciation for Lieutenant Larry Scallon. Good evening, uh, Minister, Mayor, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name, as is already mentioned, is Lieutenant Larry Scallon, and I am uh, a servant officer in the 3rd Infantry Battalion inside the barracks in Kilkenny. I have had, I spent the last, most of the last 25 years working in the barracks, and it's been my, my great pleasure to be uh, employed there. And I have to say today, for me personally, it was an emotional time when uh, we reenacted the 90th anniversary, because it had been something that was close to my heart personally for the last number of years. The picture you see there before you is, uh, was taken on the 7th of February 1922, and the gentlemen all involved there had very re recently, up until them, all been on some part of active service. The, in the front rank there, the sixth man from your left, that's uh, Judge Comerford, as he became. He was from Coon County, Kilkenny. So with that, I'll just move on with my presentation. So the background. As you can see, the cap badge, which has been associated with the Defence Forces since its foundation, uh, and, and the volunteers in particular. And the volunteers were founded on the 25th of November, 1913. So really, we can trace our history back to that date as a Defence Force, and it would be... Uh, particularly that that date is almost just look it's over a year away but uh, it, we will be a hundred years in existence at that date. Uh, it was formed in Dublin uh, in the Rotunda uh, and it was uh, as, as in a large address and a large number of volunteers signed up that day. However on the 4th of March 1914 the, the volunteers there was a volunteer meeting in Kilkenny in the town hall and, and, the, and that meeting was addressed by Roger Casement and it was addressed by uh, McDermott, uh, McDonough, sorry, Tomás McDonough. Uh, and the large attendance there, uh, a num uh, hundreds of volunteers joined up on that day. So you can, you can uh, determine that the, the formal existence of the National Irish, Irish, Irish National Volunteers in Kilkenny comes from the 5th of March, 1914. The main people involved during that time was, first of all, Father Della Hunty, who was the curate out in Callan, a very well-known and big organiser of the Sinn Féin movement in South Kilkenny at that time. Big interest in the Irish language, and he was very actively involved in the volunteers. He was uh, most definitely uh, 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 heavily critical of uh, British occupation, and the gentleman on his, uh, on his left, as I'm from, from me and your right, is uh, Peter de Lucre. Peter DeLucre would serve as a term of four mayorships in Kilkenny, 1919 to 1923. He would be a senator, an independent senator in the fifth doll, and he was elected uh, a TD in the sixth doll. So he was a very, very important Kilkenny politician right through the, the 20s. Uh, he was very actively involved in, in uh, the leading of the volunteer movement in County Kilkenny. So in, seven, in September 1914, then, we had already had, we should say, in August, the uh, declaration of war, the First World War. So John Redmond then, in Woodenbridge, uh, decided and declared his desire that the volunteer movement would fight for the freedom of small nations and would sign up into British regiments, Irish regiments of the British Army. And this then would have uh, caused to cause a large split within the volunteer movement. Uh, McNeil on the left there, uh, he would have been anti this, uh, this thought. And, and uh, in Kilkenny then, on the 23rd of September, roughly, uh, the, there was a large meeting in the market yard. Uh, uh, over 650 volunteers uh, paraded. Uh, Father Rowe St. Mary's and Father Moore St. John's spoke in favour of Redmond's thoughts process. Peter DeLucre, Pat Corcoran and Ned Comerford sp spoke against it. Of the split, 
600 plus volunteers uh, sided with the Redmanites, and 28 Irish volunteers then, as they would become known, sided with Peter de Lucre. They fell in in trees and they were, part, they were marched by Thomas Tracy up to a place called Bamba Hall, which we would now recognise as Hitler's Inn. And there they formed their headquarters. So we'll move on, Easter 1916 then, to move on the whole thing. Uh, Captain Thomas Tracy met with Cahal Brewer in Kilkenny uh, on April the 14th. Uh, and uh, also at that time, Mrs. Bulmer Hobson was sent down to Kilkenny with uh, uh, orders for Peter de Lucre. And she delivered them to, them to him by hand, I think the Wednesday before Easter, Easter 1916. And uh, within that was the orders for the Kilkenny Battalion to form up on Easter Sunday to go on active service with 24 hours pack rations and all weapons and ammunition they had. And they were to meet the Wexford Battalion in Scullow Gap. Uh, and from there they were to advance forward to meet up and, and to fight with the Dublin Volunteers. However, we all know that uh, the planned operations were, uh, they were uh, compromising that there was a large advertisement placed in the papers where, which indicated that the, the operations or the manoeuvres were cancelled. So the Kilkenny volunteers did form up on Easter Sunday. They did parade for six nights of the following seven nights, waiting orders from Dublin to actually go on active service. But the order never arrived. They were, uh, Captain Ginger O'Connell, JJ O'Connell was the commander in Kilkenny. He was here to coordinate that move. Uh, but on for, for whatever reason, the order to mobilize never came. So at the start of 1918 then, the order of battle, as I would recognise it, how the, how the battalion was deployed, was like this. Kilkenny City and Northern Kilkenny Battalion was commanded by Thomas Tracy. Uh, Castlecomer Battalion was commanded by James Cullerton, and the South Kilkenny Battalion was commanded by Martin Keeley. That's the way it was at that time. So the next impact then was you had the, the, conscript, the conscription threat in 1918. There was a, an act passed in Parliament which made it possible for Irish men to be conscripted into the British Army. However, that caused a general strike, and new companies of the volunteers sprung up overnight. So the volunteers, by the end of uh, 1918, there was over 100,000 men in, in 1,200 companies. So the effect on that, in Kilkenny, was that we now had a new order of battle. Uh, Kilkenny now had a brigade headquarters in 1920, and it had nine battalions. The battalion's commander, or the brigade OC, was Thomas Tracy from 30 Dean Street. The brigade 2IC was uh, James Lawler from Walken Street, Walken Street, the brigade adjutant was Leo Dardis from James Street, and the brigade quartermaster was Ned Comerford from Wellington Square. The nine battalions, and more or less I've localised these with the main place that they were located with. The first battalion was Kilkenny, Timothy Hennessy, Tullerone, Simon Walton, Castlecomer, Garth Brennan, Clifton, Martin Keeley, Greg Namana, James O'Hanrahan, Glenn Moore, Martin McGrath, Callan, James Rogan, uh, Huggenstown, William Farrell, and the 9th Battalion, so far I've been unable to trace where they were located or who their company commander was. At that time, uh, it should, it's very important to know how, how the, I call them here, the opposing forces, the, the opposition, the, the, the enemy. Uh, so what was in Kilkenny? What, what Crown forces were in Kilkenny? Well, there was a brigade headquarters in the barracks, in Kilkenny barracks, and they had two batteries of artillery. The 136 and 146 field batteries. A battery would have approximately 150 soldiers in it. The Devonshire Regiment, which were headquartered in Waterford, had two companies in Kilkenny, exceeding over 300 soldiers. The Black and Tans were uh, located in pockets around the county in, in undeterminable numbers. However, the auxiliaries were located in Woodstock. A company of the auxiliaries were located in Woodstock, and they always had between 86 and 100 auxiliaries in, 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 in that place. And the Royal Irish Constabulary, which are the last part, we'll call them, of the opposing forces, uh, were, for the most part, Irishmen, for the most part, Catholics, for the most part, the second sons of farmers, who, who, who treated it as a genuine occupation, uh, uh, and for, in quite a few cases, were actively involved in supporting the, the whole uh, independence cause by uh, in making guys aware that they were very likely to be arrested in the near future. So they would not be classified in the same terms as opposing forces as the remainder of them, but they still have to be seen as opposing forces for the purposes of determining who you're facing. The one thing I'll say about the RIC is every little village and pocket in County Kilkenny at the time had an RIC detachment, if not barracks. 
Typical barracks here, Fadown Barracks in Kilkenny, so in Kilkenny at the time, seen a very uh, well-built structure, uh, difficult to attack and, and, and well-manned. Other barracks here, uh, this one is in Gorn, and the existing Garda barracks in, in Bennis Bridge is, is pre-existed as an RAC barracks. So they're the types of barracks that were located in all the little towns and villages in County Kilkenny, as well as a major headquarters here on John Street, and also on Parliament Street there was a large uh, RAC barracks as well. So, so why was Kilkenny determined to have been quiet at the very start? Well, here's a, here's a satellite picture of Kilkenny. And they didn't have them in the 20s, but I can show you now what does Kilkenny look like. It's flat as a pancake. It's very fertile land. It always well, was well farmed, tillage farming mostly, grazed the pastures. So what did that mean to a soldier who's trying to put in an ambush site? There were very few ambush sites in County Kilkenny at the time. There was a good road network. Uh, if you were going to put in an ambush anywhere in Kilkenny in the start of the, uh, 1920, uh, the possibility is you would have been compromised. You would have been caught. And the doctrine of the volunteers was that your operation had to have a meaningful chance of success. There was no kamikazes or no suicide missions. Volunteers were a scarce commodity. In fact, your rifle you were carrying was even scarcer than you. But, uh, and they certainly didn't want to be losing arms and ammunition. They wanted to try and gain arms and ammunition. So what did they do? Or to show you, for instance, just to contrast it with the typical Kerry Cork area, all the brown areas there are are, what are they? They're, they're hills, they're mountains. Very good terrain for guerrilla warfare. Didn't exist in County Kilkenny. The guys in Kilkenny, when they were going out, and Carlow and, and Wexford, when they were going out, were getting out into an environment where their chance of, a uh, good chance of escape, was a lot reduced compared to the people operating in the south of Ireland. So what did the Kilkenny guys decide to do? They decided that they would have to uh, de- terror or reduce the ability of the RIC to have their eyes on the ground to give early warning of uh, missions which were happening. So they started that and it, this is one of the very first major successes in, count, in the whole of Ireland where an RIC barracks was taken, taken by a volunteer uh, mission. So it was led by the 1st and 7th battalions the volunteers, the 1st Battalion being to Kenny, and the 7th Battalion being the Callum Battalion. And the Callum Battalion were the 1st Battalion in County Kilkenny to have an active service unit, a flying column. Uh, and they, activate, they, act, they were very active during their entire uh, duration of their time. So on March the 20th, it was decided that they were going to attack Huggenstown RIC barracks. So, and which they did very successfully. 60 volunteers took part, of which 38 were intimately involved in the assault on Huggenstown barracks. During that assault, Constable Ryan of the RIC was killed. Uh, he, was, he was blown up by a homemade uh, grenade. Uh, but what was the lasting effect of this was that the RIC now were very concerned about the safety of their officers. So they withdrew all their satellite barracks. They closed them. So what did that do? It gave freedom of movement to the volunteer movement. They achieved their mission in County Kilkenny. They could now operate with a much greater degree of secrecy in the outlying districts of the county. The RIC now had to operate mostly with combined uh, patrols of the Devonshire Regiment, which were the occupying regiment, and the RIC and the auxiliaries. So what happened then was the RIC, or the auxiliaries that I've already mentioned, this year's Woodstock House, they took over uh, the, their, and made their headquarters of the auxiliary, A Company, the auxiliaries, in the 26th of August, 1920. Uh, this was the mind, uh, the brainchild of Winston Churchill, uh, he was the first guy that mentioned the fact that we should have a gendarmerie in, in Ireland to put down uh, or the insurrection or the, to quell the, what was going on. And then it was a fellow called uh, General Tudor. He was the guy who actually, uh, he, he was the guy who, uh, first of all, Churchill's idea was squashed, but General Tudor then, in, in June of that year, re, re, reinvigorated this whole concept of, of an armed auxiliary force or temporary cadets, as they were officially called. And one of the first uh, commanders in there, uh, Lieutenant Bruce, he was uh, one of the first guys who were uh, part of the occupying force of Inishtig, uh, Woodstock House. There's the letter that was handed over at the end of uh, the Woodstock House occupation, and it's just signed off by the Major handing it back, and he handed it, it was handed back on uh, the 17th of June, uh, uh, it was actually 19, later on 22 there, 1922, okay? And that's the, his, his original signature. So now I'm going to move on to Ernie O'Malley. Ernie O'Malley was sent by GHQ 
to County Kilkenny, to Inishtig, and to the House of Commandant O'Hanrahan, who was the commander of the Inishtig Battalion, and he was sent down to coordinate a combined effort to attack Woodstock House. Unfortunately for him, after his first night in Inishtig, in Commandant O'Hanrahan's house, there was a raid on the house, uh, and Ernie O'Malley was uh, arrested. And while he was arrested, he gave the name of Bernard Stewart as being his address, uh, or his name, and Kilkenny City as being his address. The guys who arrested him and brought the auxiliaries who brought him to Woodstock House really didn't know who he was. And he was held overnight in Woodstock House, and from there he was transferred into Kilkenny Military Barracks Detention Centre, uh, which still exists today. And he spent a week there before he was sent on to Dublin, to, be, to, to uh, Kilmainham Jail, from where he would eventually escape. The picture on... The, the, you're right up there, is a picture taken of him, as he says himself in his book, while he was in detention in Kilkenny Military Barracks. He was brought outside to the exercise yard one morning, and he just took that picture of him there. So, but what really happened was that Ernie O'Malley's notebook was, was taken during the raid. And in that notebook, he had the name of all the members of the active service unit in Kilkenny, the 7th Battalion in particular, and the names of all the brigade commanders the brigade commander and his staff. So they were all arrested. So the headquarters staff and most of the active members of, uh, Woods, uh, of the, the Kilkenny Brigade were now in custody. As a result of the, uh, as I might, might as well mention it here now, the reason that Woodstock today looks like it, do, looks like it does burnt was because that after the, the evacuation of the auxiliaries, uh, it was burnt to the ground to prevent them using it again. Okay, so the next thing we had was the Restoration Order of Ireland Act, and that suspended civil courts. And that meant that everybody who was on a wanted list was now being actively looked for. Uh, they had to go on the run. They couldn't stay in their houses because every day there was people, their houses were being raided. And martial law was extended to the southeast of Ireland in January 1921. Uh, and... and uh, uh, and these guys, all the guys, the George, the Wires, and everybody else, now were, had to go on the run. <laughs> but uh, George now, because of the lack of leadership, because they were all incarcerated, George the Wire became the Brigade Commandant, or the OC, of the Kilkenny Brigade. And he directly decided to improve brigade structure. He imposed the need for offensive action. We can't sit back. We have to get out there. We have to fight the good fight. Let's be active out there. And plan future op operations in detail. So he wasn't just thinking about tomorrow, he was thinking about next month, six months' time. Let's, let's get this thing on a sound foot while operating operational security. Without compromising ourselves, we have to still maintain ourselves on an offensive footing. So their first uh, thing, uh, operation, one of them was the Friary Street ambush. This wasn't directly controlled by uh, General O'Dwyer, this was controlled by... Commandant Hennessy, the brother of the Captain Hennessy, who actually died during it. And this was an attempt to disarm six Devonshire soldiers while carrying the ration wagon, escorting the ration wagon from the barracks to the jail. And, uh, and as we know, and you can read the plaque, and the next time you're passing Friary Street, you'll see that the uh, volunteers, the Hennessy and volunteers Dermody, uh, died during that operation. The next one was the Euskerti, Euskerti ambush, and that happened just outside Castle Comer. And this was a very successful assault by the active service unit from the 5th Battalion, the Greg Namana uh, Battalion. And they ambushed an RIC Devonshire uh, regiment. One report I've read indicates that there was three coffins seen leaving uh, Castle Comer barracks the next morning. However, the official report indicates one soldier seriously up, uh, injured or wounded. But it was successful. They now had momentum in County Kilkenny. The next one I'll mention is the Cool Bond Ambush. We all, we've all heard of the Cool Bond Ambush. Very well organised, meticulously prepared for. However, the, 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 there was no military reason why this ambush was compromised. It was compromised because they let through a young man who was afraid of his employer and he had to be let through because he was afraid of the school and he'd get going to work that morning. However, when he got to his place of employment, the big house, he had to tell her, his employer why he was late for work. After he told her that he'd been stopped by strangers down the road, uh, she immediately dispatched somebody to inform the, the local uh, Devonshire Regiment platoon which were occupying uh, Castlecomer barracks at the time. Consequently, they sent their guys out and, and they surrounded the, the Cool Bawn ambush site. But most of the guys did escape, but unfortunately, Nicholas Mullins and Sean Hartley were killed during that action. These are some uh, guys that uh, 
I have their names, I just don't have them up on the screen. They survived the cool bond, and this picture was taken about a week after uh, the, the, the burial of the guys from the cool bond accident, from the cool bond incident. Okay, 11th of July 1921, we had our truce, treaty negotiations, signed the 6th of December. The treaty debates went on, and on the 7th of January, we had our, 90, we had our vote. Uh, and then on the 7th of February 1922, the barracks was taken over by the Free State soldiers. It, it was a very, very significant, important day. It was Wexford Barracks, Carlow Barracks and Kilkenny Barracks were actually taken over on the same day, but they were one of the very first barracks outside of Dublin, and in fact some of the barracks in Dublin wouldn't be handed over for almost another year. Uh, it was uh, a very uh, uh, well, it was a very important, significant time in the city here, and this was, didn't go unacknowledged by all the participants of the parade. The parade left James's Park and it went up. Here we see uh, Parliament Street. It followed the Parliament Street route back in the day, and then it went up to the parade. And this is the parade as they would have stood on it on the day. Uh, it looks a lot better now, I have to say, but even in its own day, it did look nice. Uh, and this is where George Dwyer held his company or his battalion or his brigade uh, for up to half an hour just to let the guys soak in the atmosphere of what they were really going to do. The parade was led by St. James's or St. Patrick's Brass and Reed Band. They, and they played very uh, uh, suitable tunes while they were marching up, or songs while they were marching up through the rest of the parade. They then moved up John Street here, you can see at McDonough Junction, you will be looking out at McDonough Junction, John Street crosses up there, the top there, and uh, they would have marched very proudly up there. And I should say on their way up, as was mentioned today already, they got massive cheers when they were passing the brewery, they got massive cheers when they were passing the, the 13 High Street was where the brigade headquarters was prior to this day. Uh, and, and they got, the friars were all down at the end of the street, and I will say that the friars were the only guys, everybody before they went on active service, always got their confessions heard. And in the city of Kilkenny, it is said, and it is in the records, that the friars were the one, uh, would always hear their confessions before every operation, and they did hear the Friary Street Ambush People's operation, uh, confessions that morning. And then we would have moved on into the barracks. And this is the barracks as they would have took it over in 1922, or very similar to this. There would have been no, no difference. This is it. So right where those two gentlemen are standing is the corner of the officer's mess. And the British, uh, the British regiment, the Devonshire regiment, had a 30-man uh, honour guard there, and they saluted arms when they walked in, when the guys marched in. They marched straight into the square, uh, and, and uh, they took over. They, they, they went, marched straight into the square, and it was handed over. As mentioned already, the, the flagpole was taken down and the tricolour was flown for the first time. And not only that, it uh, was a, a motive for me today. Uh, that day was the first day the national anthem was played uh, within the military barracks. Uh, it wouldn't, wasn't known as the national anthem quite then, but it w would become known as it very shortly afterwards. So after the Free State, after we took over, it was a contentious time, and there's nobody denying that. It, it wasn't plain sailing. And... and uh, around about May in 1922, one call them an anti-treaty guys yet, because the war is such, but there was no civil war. But guys who were opposed to the treaty on the 3rd of May 1922 assaulted Kilkenny Castle, and they took over the castle, and they took over the town hall. So, and there was a detachment of 200 additional soldiers sent from Dublin by train. And this here is a picture of the final assault on Kilkenny Castle on the 3rd of May 1922. Now, it is said that it was ended amenably, and I'm not saying it wasn't, but this is the only existing photograph I can see, I, I have ever been able to find, just uh, of an assault happening on Kilkenny Castle. And if you do go into the castle and you go upstairs, particularly on the side facing uh, John's Bridge, there are bullet holes uh, still in the, the woodwork in the castle, in, in the internal part of the castle. So it, was all, it did all happen. So then we know we had our civil war, and I'm not going to dwell on this, the 28th of June to the 24th of May, 1923. And the main leader here, because General Dwyer had now gone to the civil guards, so the, main, the general in Kilkenny and in charge of the Waterford Brigade was a man called Brigade, uh, Brigade Commandant John Prout. So John Prout was the commander in Kilkenny from, uh, during the Civil War. And he was one of the most successful free state brigade commanders of the Civil War. I can say that. I'm not an authority on the Civil War, but in my opinion, he certainly was. He led the assault from Kilkenny. He used Kilkenny as his base, and he moved southwards. He took Waterford, he took Carrigan Shore, and he took on down as far as 
uh, as just the Cork border. He's seen there in uniform, on active service, in Kerrig on shore there, uh, 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 just uh, that's, uh, that picture. The other picture of his painting there is uh, on exhibit. It's actually on display in the officer's mess in, in, in Stevens Barracks. General Prout would uh, be find out about his demobilisation when he was reading the Sunday Independent one day in 1924. Uh, so he, he, he didn't spend a long time in, in the, the forces. He then emigrated back to America where he retired and lived a long and hearty life. Here I just want to show you, this is a very nice example of a handover uh, in Carlow uh, of changing of the guard of the Free State, early Free State, and there you can see uh, this is Carlow military barracks and, and the tricolour flying very proudly there in the middle of the, the Honour Guard. The 47th Battalion were the first uh, pre-treaty uh, battalion to be uh, located in the barracks. They were garrisoned there. Uh, there's a picture of the servant officers just over here on my left, and you're welcome to have a look at them later on. December 29th, I should mention that there were two executions in the barracks, uh, Private John Murphy, and, or Volunteer John Murphy and Volunteer John Phelan, who were anti-treatyites. Uh, they were found in possession of arms and ammunition and were uh, sentenced to death by uh, court-martial in barracks and were executed on the 29th of December 1922. My bibliography, where did I find the information I got for tonight's talk? I got them from the witness statements from military archives, of which I have all the Kilkenny witness statements here for you to look at tonight afterwards. I also got them from Judge Comerford's very uh, uh, explanatory uh, Michael Kenny IRA days. It's a big book, it's over a thousand pages. Uh, the, the Flying Column West Kilkenny, Mr. Jim Maher, who wrote it, and On Another Man's Wound, Ernie O'Malley. Uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'd just like to complete my talk and thank you very much.